There's a concept that we don't talk about much these days, but that was fairly common in the ancient world. And in fact, highly respected and practiced by the Romans at times and by others. Right, and that's the idea of the noble suicide. Right, killing yourself before your enemies could get their hands on you. And part of the reasons we don't really explore those themes these days in literature and internet comment section wars is because we've created a world for ourselves that's free of most of the dangers that ancient people faced. At least in the modern world, what people like to call the the first world, even though I'm not a fan of that term. We are free of the worry that an unknown horde of people can just come over the hill, take everything we have, kill our family members, and sell us into slavery. But this was a common occurrence in the ancient world, and in fact, you might even say that it was the natural order of things in this environment, right? It shaped the societies that existed back then, right? Those, the, the soil from which our own society has grown. And today we're going to hear about a group of people who took that choice, right? Out of their enemy's hands and unto themselves. And it's a tragic but courageous story. I know you're going to love it. On courage and conflict. So in 143 B.C., the tribes of the Aravaki, who had allied with Viriathus, decided to continue their hostilities against the Romans. And the Romans, they sent a series of generals in to deal with this problem, but they would be unsuccessful. Right? And this war, the reason I'm calling it the Numantine War, is because it's centered around the city of Numantia which, if you remember from previous episodes, has been central to this conflict since the beginning. The Romans have tried to take this city before and failed. And so Rome sends in uh, a man named uh, Macedonicus. Now this is probably a, a title more than a name. And he goes in and tries to take the city and he is rebuffed. So he's unsuccessful. And the next guy that Rome sends in is named Quintus Pompeius. Pompeius Aulus. And his campaign is described as a series of blunders and misadventures. Now, I've read over two uh, different accounts of this, and they've referred to him both as Quintus Pompeius and Pompeius Aulus. And it's unclear to me whether he was the Pompeius Aulus who was defeated earlier in the Celtiberian Wars, but if so, it, it, it would make it extra, you know, just extra. So Quintus Pompeius, after a series of what are described as severe defeats at the hands of the Celtiberians, is forced to negotiate a secret treaty with Numantia. And It's kind of funny because a new general kind of arrives, uh, a guy named Lanus, and when the when the Celtiberians arrive to, you know, fulfill their end of the treaty, where they're like they're paying an indemnity, maybe they're exchanging some hostages. (laughs) Quintus Pompeius just denies ever having made any such peace. He just basically lies. (laughs) It becomes this debacle where. 
it has to be referred back to the Senate. And the Senate ultimately decides to ignore the secret treaty that Quintus Pompeius had negotiated and to continue the war. And they send in a man named Mancinus. Now, Gaius Mancinus, Caius or Gaius, you know, it's spelled with a C, but that could be pronounced G, but I'm going to call him Caius Mancinus. He's, he's described at least by uh, Plutarch as being not bad as a man, but <laughs> quite unfortunate as a general, something like that. Mancinus, he suffers a series of really humiliating defeats at the hands of the Celtiberians. He, he attacks the walls and he's repulsed several times. But now, serving in the legion of Caius Mancinus is a young Tiberius Gracchus. All right? And you might remember his father, Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus. He was the one who had negotiated the peace with the Celtiberians that had lasted like 20 something years. And so the name of Gracchus in the region, believe it or not, it held a lot of sway, right? People viewed Tiberius Gracchus as having an honorable name. And honorable he was. Before the Numantine War, Tiberius Gracchus the Younger served in the army of Scipio Africanus. And he was uh, supposedly one of the first uh, to the walls of Carthage, right? And he came to serve under Mancinus after he'd fought with Scipio Africanus, right? And, and Tiberius had supposedly shared Scipio's tent and learned a lot about his commander. You know, he, he'd basically been sort of groomed, if you will, by the great Scipio Africanus. And so, even though Mancinus is uh, the general of the army, Tiberius Gracchus' name, it carries a lot of weight. And uh, there comes a period in the war where Mancinus tries to attack the walls and he keeps getting rebuffed. And so finally, Mancinus tries to... It, it, it was written down that he tried to escape in the night <laughs> with... with uh, maybe a small unit of his men and the Numantines learned about this escape, to, escape attempt and they fell upon Mancinus and his men, you know, killed a bunch of them and they encircled the entire army right and uh, it says in the text that they forced them into some terrain that was difficult to get out of. they basically encircled them and had them trapped you know, dead to rights as they say and so Mancinus uh, is kind of panicking, you know, people, or people. In the text, it says something like he forgot even that he was a general. And he sends heralds to the Celtiberians asking for peace terms. He wants to negotiate a treaty. And the Celtiberians, they come back and they say that they would trust no Roman save for Tiberius Gracchus. And this, for me, is a really interesting turn in the story. Right, every now and then in some of these stories of ancient battles, you find these times when, you know, enemies meet on the battlefield and there's a clear respect that they have for one another. Right, the Numantines respected Tiberius as a soldier and they respected his father's name, right? His father had negotiated that peace treaty with them and had always treated them well. And so Mancinus agrees to send Tiberius to the Celtiberians. And Tiberius goes to negotiate the terms of this peace. And though he's able to save thousands of Roman lives, right, he does so in a way that uh, the Senate will later feel is sort of embarrassing, right? He. He's forced to kind of give up everything in the Roman camp to the Numantines as plunder. And the army agrees to withdraw, so, you know, the army forms up and starts to march away. But Tiberius had his official ledgers in the camp. 
and you know he was he he he, he held some office in Rome and these these ledgers were part of the office right so he decides to turn back with only a few of his companions and ride back to Numantia and when he gets there he he just summon, he summons the magistrates of the city and he just asks them if he can have his ledgers back just kind of ask them you know hey can I get these back they you know they, they have some important information and I want to be able to give an accounting of my administration something like that and the Numantines actually agree and you know apparently they they all shook his hand and they they kind of you know you can imagine a lot of back slapping and they tell him please you know don't look at us as enemies anymore let's be friends right according to the Numantia anyway this peace would hopefully hold with the Romans we're forgetting the Roman greed and ambition that is so characteristic especially at this time and so the peace that Tiberius negotiates with the Numantines is eventually going to be ignored and it's going to have devastating consequences for the region So when Tiberius Gracchus and Mancinus return to Rome and bring news of this defeat and this treaty back to the Senate and the people, there, there arose this great, you know, debacle. The first thing is that the people flocked to Tiberius. Right, the people loved the fact that he had negotiated to save the lives of so many Roman citizens, and it was it was like twenty thousand lives he had saved. And these are the the legionaries, you know these the, these are the poor of Rome. But now there was another group of people, another group of people who thought that the you know they were so outraged by the embarrassment of this treaty. And the defeat under the, you know, under the leadership of Mancinus, that they wanted to bring back an old tradition that had been done during, you know, during some of Rome's wars with the Samnites. So what they wanted to do was gather up all the officers of the legion, you know, from, you know, to uh, casters to the consul put them in chains and deliver them to the Numantines. This is kind of, I suppose, both a, probably a move that might be similar to passing under the yoke. I don't know if you know what that is, but that's when the enemies would uh, force you to walk under a yoke of spears. This was both seen as kind of an act of humiliation and an act of redemption. Like it was, you know, you took your shame and that was it. But th maybe this was something similar for the entirety of the nation. This is an expression of our shame. You know, we did a re really bad job last time. Here's the generals. You can have them. So, Tiberius Gracchus, who, is a, who was an officer, is kind of caught in the middle of this fight. Because the people, they love Tiberius. And there was a lot of goodwill for Tiberius Gracchus for having saved so many lives, but at the same time, the people are outraged at the nature of the treaty. So, there's another man in Rome at this time, and that is Scipio Africanus. And if you remember, Scipio was sort of like a patron of Tiberius. He had groomed Tiberius during the war for Carthage, and it's... It reads in the text, at least, that Scipio had some sort of... He'd taken a liking to Tiberius. There were a lot of things about Tiberius, you know, maybe a lot of ideas he had that Scipio didn't agree with. But he had a relationship with young men. And he wasn't about to let the people of Rome turn Tiberius Gracchus over to the Numantines. So he stands up and he speaks on Tiberius' behalf and with the support of the people and with Scipio Africanus, 
they decide to send only Mancinus back to the Numantines in chains. And so the general of the huge blunder there in Numantio was sent back to the enemy in fetters. And I just find that tradition really interesting. Now the next part of this grand negotiation regarded the actual peace that had been negotiated with the Numantines. And there is some uh, evidence in the text that suggests that, you know, Scipio Africanus, he could have stepped in the way that he had in order to save Tiberius's life, that he possibly could have stepped in to uphold the peace with the Numantines that Tiberius had forged, albeit with his back to the wall and a sword to his throat. But he didn't. And there seems to have been a problem between the two men, uh, mainly that Tiberius was young and he wa- he had very uh, popu- populare sympathies. He was, he was sympathetic to the cause of the populares. And the populares were the political party in Rome that basically advocated for causes of the poor, right? And opposing them would have been the optimates, and the optimates were the nobility, the senators of Rome. And they, if you want to couch them in very basic, basic, basic terms, you might consider the populares to be left and the optimates to be right. But in Rome, the situation was very different. So I don't want you to think of the optimates as Republicans. That would just be too simplistic. Right, the optimates believed that they were upholding this, the, the spirit and tradition of Rome. You know, the rules that had uh, carried her to greatness. And there were even these people who held the laws of, 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 the, of the ancient traditions, you know, in their memory. The populares, on the other hand, were interested in changing things for what they saw as the greater good. Right. Tiberius would later, after this point, go on to propose some agrarian laws that would lead to a huge political upheaval in Rome, and that would result in his death. That's another story. The point is, is that Scipio Africanus, he had problems with Tiberius's populare leanings, right? And he didn't like some of the people that were around him. He said that he had sophists all around him, urging him on. And a sophist, if you've ever heard the word sophistry, you know, a sophist is basically a person who, uh, you know, <laughs> believes that the the more, if they can argue a point well enough, that that makes it true. And sophistry has long been associated with just, you know, an unending stream of bullshit. And so, Scipio Africanus thought that Tiberius Gracchus was surrounded by bullshitters, basically. And he didn't like the crowd that he hung out with, and so... Scipio didn't step in to uphold the peace that Tiberius had negotiated. And instead, he will be deployed to to Numantia, eventually, to clean up the situation that had arisen there. So in 135, in the next year, Scipio Emilianus Africanus, and remember, Scipio had been to the Iberian Peninsula before. This was the same fiery youth who had stood up and excoriated his peers for not wanting to fight during the earlier iteration of the Celtiberian Wars. And now after having successfully brought Carthage to its knees and then burned it to the ground. Scipio was called upon again by the Senate to go and pacify the Iberian Peninsula for good, according to them. And so Scipio begins to amass an army. And he had a lot of trouble finding people 
to fight because the prospect for looting, basically, was really low. If you remember, Lucellus had failed to find any gold, and so most of the wealth coming out of Iberia at this point is, you know, probably counted in slaves. And this is just on the, this is maybe in the middle of a process where the Roman Republic begins to have way too many slaves in its population. But that is also another story. So Scipio starts to gather his army, and he's, despite the difficulties in finding recruits, he's able to gather 20,000 legionaries and over 40,000 allied auxiliaries. All right, and this is like a, a group of rock stars of the Roman Republic, right? There's a lot of famous people who fought in this battle, right, in this war and marched with Scipio. There's Scipio himself who, you know, to the Romans is this grand figure. There's Gaius Marius who fights with Scipio. And Gaius Marius, if you don't know, is going to go on to make major changes in the Republic that will eventually lead, pave the way, let's say, for those who tip the scales from Republic to Empire. Now, there's also, there's also Jugurtha, who was the leader of Numidian cavalry, who fought with Scipio in this war and would later raise a rebellion against Rome. And he would have to fight against Gaius Marius, with whom he was fighting alongside in this war. So you can see the, you know, the relationships and, and the web of, uh, of personalities is, is all here, right? It's all complicated and it's all, it's all interlocked. And that's one element I find really interesting about these wars, you know. It, it, was, it, was, it was like every famous person in Rome did a turn here, did a tour here. Now, Tiberius Gracchus is not going to return to Demantia with Scipio Emilianus. In fact, he goes on to become Tribune of the Plebs, and while Scipio is dealing with the problem of Numantia, Tiberius Gracchus will be killed in Rome due to his attempted agrarian reforms. Now, I wonder if the two had a final parting if you were that, you know, I haven't found anything written down about it, but, you know, I imagine with their relationship, you know, Scipio actually, I believe, married Tiberius' sister. So, I can imagine some final parting words between them. Maybe Scipio tries to give the young Tiberius advice, which he subsequently ignores, and, you know, goes on to try to make so much change that the Optimates haven't killed. So, Scipio leaves Rome behind, and Rome is a tinderbox, right? There are a lot of people who think that Tiberius never would have been killed if Scipio himself had been in Rome. Because in Scipio's absence, Rome sort of erupts into this into a lot of political violence, into the first, you know, opening blows, you might say, of the political upheavals that will usher in the Roman Empire. But that, again, is another story. So, Scipio marches into Hispania with his huge army, and he finds the Roman camps there in a sorry state. There were a couple of generals who would come in and uh, basically just avoided conflict with the Numantines for the entire year between Mancinus' defeat and Scipio's return. They basically just avoided fighting. And Scipio finds the camps in, you know, disarray. And the way it's written is that Scipio kind of comes in like a drill sergeant, you know? Like, imagine the guy from a Full Metal Jacket, you know, except dressed in, you know, Roman garb, marching up and down the lines, just talking all kinds of shit to his recruits, 
you know, tighten your belt. You're wearing your gladius on the wrong side. You know, things like that. And he basically goes around and he, he, he finds that the soldiers have fallen into a lot of disciplinary problems. You know, maybe they're, they're not upholding the Roman standard. There are a lot of, uh, shall we say, ladies of the night in camp. You know, a lot of camp followers interspersed with the legionaries. And so Scipio decides he's got to tighten things up. And he kicks all the camp followers out. He runs out the lawn dresses and the, forgive me for this word, but the prostitutes, you know, the working girls. He basically gets rid of all the distractions and he starts to drill these soldiers day and night, right? Scipio takes this undisciplined horde that the legions in Hispania had become. And you have to, you have to, imagine that their morale was probably at an all-time low right because they'd suffered defeat after defeat after defeat they tried and failed to take Numantia several times they'd been encircled and humiliated by the enemy you know they were in this foreign land far from home surrounded by their enemies I can't imagine what sort of game, what a game, what sort of pressure that would put on a young soldier. I'm a veteran myself, so I understand to some extent going to war, but the way they did it in the ancient world was, of course, completely different. You know, you're not flying home on a C-130 from the wars in Hispania, you know. It's a long march back home, and oftentimes these legionaries will be gone for years at a time, you know? It is nine years between the outbreak of war, this just this war, the Numantine War, until Scipio marches into Hispania. Nine years. And again, the region had been at war for, for decades before that. So, in a way, this is like Rome's Afghanistan. You know, Afghanistan is one of those regions in the world where so many armies have passed through it and the people there have been fighting since like the days of Alexander. You know, they've had to deal with invaders on an almost constant basis. And Spain at this time, I picture to be a little bit like Afghanistan. I'm saying Spain, but you know, I mean Hispania, the Iberian Peninsula. You had Carthage who is the old occupying power, you know? You've got Rome now, the new occupying power, and you've got war that flares up all over Hispania for like a hundred years, maybe 200 years. I'll have to go back and do the math. So, all of that has to be weighing on the minds of the legionaries who were there to fight. You know, these are not some rabble that the legions can easily scatter, right? These people have been handing the Romans their asses for the last 10 years. But Scipio, he sees these men in this sorry state. He, he drills the soldiers day and night, and he makes of them a true fighting force. And by the time Scipio is ready to march on Numantia, right, he's got a huge legion full of shit-hot soldiers, right? He's got rock stars in his legion. He's got Jugurtha. He's got Caius Marius, right? He's got 20,000 battle-ready legionaries and 40,000 auxiliaries. And at their head, you know, is the mind of Scipio Africanus, the man who took down Carthage. And Scipio, by this time, you know, he's an older fellow. But he's no less sharp for his age. And you're going to see that soon. Scipio marches on Domantia with this juggernaut legion behind him. And when they arrive, 
they settle in to besiege the city, right? And Scipio builds a big wall all around the city, right? And then he builds two camps and builds another wall behind those camps in order to protect them from any relief forces that might come to the aid of the Numantines. And if you're a history nerd, this might sound familiar to you because it was a tactic used by another famous Roman general at an even more infamous battle. And that was Julius Caesar at Alesia. And maybe, maybe this is where Caesar got the idea. Perhaps. But after Scipio has constructed these walls, he builds seven towers along the wall so that his archers can shoot down into the city. And there's also a river that come that, that comes into Numantia and, and Scipio has this damned and towered so that there there's like a moat created between the city and his walls. And also he strings a cable across that river between those towers and and hangs blades from it so that any swimmers or boats are prevented from entering or exiting the city. And once his defenses are set up, you know, Scipio kind of settles in to let starvation do the job of defeating the Numantines. And, you know, the siege, the siege is a common tactic in ancient warfare. And, and it's really simple, but effective and dirty. Because when hunger sets in, in a besieged city, you know, people get really desperate. And when people get desperate, they do crazy things, right? And, and, and terrible things. And crazy and terrible things are definitely going to happen inside Numantia. But the Numantines, you know, they don't just stay inside their walls. They actually come out to fight. And, you know, there's some skirmishing uh, with the Romans. But eventually they, they're they able to sortie out of the walls. And one of their greatest warriors, a man named Bertogenes, escapes the besieged city to try and seek aid from a neighboring tribe. But... The uh, one of the tribes they go to uh, denies them. Another one uh, initially is sympathetic, but the elders of the tribe are treacherous, and they warn Scipio that Bertogenes is there. And so Scipio rushes, you know, to to catch up, and he captures these warriors, and he and and he has their hands cut off. Right. So, you know, you have this sometimes sort of heroic picture of Scipio, the way he's described in this text, you know. But remember, remember Scipio was a Roman, all right? And Romans had a very brutal sense of justice. And one of the things that Romans hated were slaves who betrayed their masters and, you know, traitors and people like that. And so these, you know, these enemies of Rome who were trying to, you know, call up aid to come against Scipio, you know, to Scipio, these were enemies. Having their hands cut off, you know, that might be kind of lenient to the Roman standard. You know, there's that famous tale of, uh, of Crassus (laughs) crucifying like 5,000 slaves on the road to Rome. So, the removal of, you know, 400 pairs of hands or so, maybe two Romans, that was, <laughs> I hate to use the expression, but a slap on the wrist. So this attempt by Ritogenes to seek aid from the neighboring tribes, tribes is unsuccessful. Right? And it fails to do anything to help lift the siege of Numantia. And things are going to get desperate for the Numantines. 
Upon Scipio's return to Numantia, the leader of the Numantines, a man named Avarice, decides to open negotiations for peace. But see, the Romans, the Romans didn't really make peace. You know, that's part of what the treaty that Tiberius and Gracchus had, had, had negotiated, part of Part of what was so embarrassing to the Romans about that is that the Romans didn't make peace, all right? With Rome, it was either total surrender, total subjugation, or the legions, you know? And at this point, I think there was some motivation that was working on Scipio because of Tiberius's peace and the Senate's embarrassment. and. I kind of get the sense, and this is my own personal interpretation, that Scipio needed to make a statement. Okay, that when Rome sent in Scipio Africanus, all right, they weren't fucking around, so to speak. You know, uh, these Celtiberians, these Numantines had embarrassed Rome for long enough. And now Scipio was going to return the favor. So when the Numantines send out ambassadors, offering total surrender for their liberty, Scipio turns them down. And so these ambassadors return to the city, and when they inform the people that Scipio had turned them down, the, the residents of the city turn on them and kill them, you know, because they believe that these ambassadors had tried to cut a deal with the Romans, which, you know, wasn't really true, but whatever. The city ended up refusing to surrender. And so they set in for a long siege. You know, and any attempt to break out of the city was rebuffed by Scipio, and they only tried like once or twice. There are some stories. There's, there's one story, for instance, about uh, Gaius Marius facing down uh, a Celtiberian warrior in single combat and catching the attention of Scipio during this fight. And there's, you know, that one big failed sortie at the beginning of the siege. But in the end, the Numantines are unable to break free. You know, Scipio has his fortifications up, his lines of circumvallation and contravalation that I misspoke earlier. I think I said counterfalation. But he's he's got the city encircled. He's got all access cut off from the outside world. And so starvation starts to set in. And it gets ugly inside Numantia. And even though things are dire, dire inside the city, the Numantines just refuse to surrender, right? Because these are the people, you know, I, I imagine these, the, these Numantines as having a huge force of will, right? Maybe they were especially stubborn. Maybe they were especially scrappy. But the Numantines not only handed the Romans their asses for so long, but, you know, besieged by Scipio Emilianus for, for what at this point is, you know, about a year or something. They still refuse to surrender, right? And after killing these ambassadors that come back and settling in for the siege, like I said, starvation starts to set in. And then, when all the food is gone, of course, cannibalism. And if you want to imagine what this is like, you know, there aren't many first-hand accounts of, of, of this. Most of this history is, of course, written by the Romans. So, we don't know exactly what took place inside but you know there are other places in history you can look to find stories of what happens inside of a siege city and uh, one such story you can you can look into the the Battle of Stalingrad and read some of the stories there and you know that is of course during World War II and you know the the level of technology was different but the stories of the besieged people will probably be at least similar 
to what the Newman teens probably experienced. It, it, it may have become, you know, hard. Maybe you didn't walk the streets of Mantia alone. Maybe you didn't let your children out, certainly not your children. For fear of your neighbor taking advantage and, you know, catching a quick bite to eat. And so the Numantines remain under siege until the late summer, I believe, of 133. And remember, Scipio had entered Hispania in 135. So this is a year and a half, two years later, that finally, after starvation had, you know, set into the populace and, you know, cannibalism had run rife through the streets, the Numantines set the city on fire rather than hand it over to Scipio Milianus. And a lot of people in the city start committing suicide with their entire families because they know what awaits them at the hands of the Romans, right? I mean, I just told you the story about Scipio having, like, these 400 youths who had welcomed Rotogenes. He had, you know, he had their hands cut off for daring, for daring to be sympathetic to the Celtiberian cause. What would happen once these people were collared and put in chains and marched back to Rome and made slaves for the rest of their lives? Certainly nothing good. And so rather than suffer that indignity, the Numantines committed suicide with their entire families and, and those who were left set the city ablaze rather than let it fall into the hands of the Romans. And so in the late summer of 133, the last remaining remnants of the Numantines finally surrender to the Romans, and Scipio marches into a burning city. And with nothing of value left, he has the ruins leveled, the same way he supposedly did with Carthage. And with the fall of Numantia, the wars in the Iberian Peninsula sort of pacify for the next 50 years. And, you know, the, at the end of this war, with the fall of Numantia and all the people dying in the city burning to the ground, it's almost, you know, symbolic. You know, these people, rather than submit to the Romans, you know, killed themselves with their, with the last energy that they had. And rather than, you know, leave their homes and their wealth and whatever it was that they had, for the legions, they set the town ablaze. And so, you know, Rome was able to pacify this province, of course. But the Numantines, anyway, went out with a bang. At the beginning of this episode, I, I mentioned the idea of the noble suicide. And how it's not so common in today's world. You know, if we heard a similar story that came out of some, you know, like, for instance, the war in the Ukraine. You know, if we had heard that Russia had besieged Ukraine and, and then rather than surrender to the Russians, the Ukrainians had blown everything up, including themselves, you know, the world would be horrified. But also there would be some people, you know, who would say, you know, you, you might feel some sense of, you know, not approval, but, you know, that sort of feeling you get when you see a fighter who, you know, fights till his absolute last breath and rather than submit, you know, he goes all the way. You might feel that, you know, that tug on your... <laughs> on your feelings, you know, when you see something like that, if you had heard a story. And, and that's the way I feel reading about the siege of Numantia, you know. 
these people who had stood up to the Romans, they fought and they were tricked over and over again. You know, they had the Roman generals, you know, one guy negotiated peace, which he later denied. Another guy negotiated peace, which was later a peace, which was later broken by the Senate. They had just been treated like shit by the Romans. And so they finally stood up to fight for their freedom, for their sovereignty. And rather than give that up, they fought to their last breath, and that's admirable. You know, even the ones who committed suicide with their whole families, you know, rather than let them be enslaved by the Romans or slaughtered by the legions. You know, in a way, that's admirable too. And that's what I wanted to impart to you with this story. That it's a tragedy. You know, but there is that thread of nobility that runs through this story. And even for the Romans, some of the Roman historians, you know, the way they wrote about the Numantines and the Celtiberians, you know, they admired their tenacity and their bravery and their skill at arms against the Roman legions. And you'll find that often in historical writings, you know, in Rome, there'll be praise for, you know, one of Rome's greatest enemies. There should be a word for that sort of respect, you know, where someone's your enemy, but you have a lot of respect for them. You know, you know what to expect from them. They're your enemy, but also you think highly of them. If there is a word for that, I don't know it. And if there isn't one, there should be one. So, if you want to read more about Numantia, I think uh, there's a few uh, fictional works. You know, there was a play, I believe, that is by the same guy who wrote Don Quixote, Miguel de Cervantes, I believe, has a play about Numantia. But there's not really much out there, and there, there aren't a whole lot of podcasts talking about it, so I wanted to try to tell the story as best I can of the Celtiberian Wars all the way to the fall of Numantia. And of course, this isn't the last rebellion that ever took place there. There's another rebellion that happens about 50 years later that's actually organized by a Roman. But he comes to the Iberian Peninsula, you know, because the, the, the Celtiberian people, they have this reputation. And it's earned during these wars where it takes one of Rome's greatest heroes to finally bring an end to this rebellion in the provinces Rome had gained from Carthage. I hope you enjoyed the journey, as dark as it has been. And I also hope that you see that this thread of nobility I'm talking about, so that I don't leave you feeling just dark and nothing else. It's okay to admire this noble suicide, this noble sacrifice made by the Numantians. And it's also okay to admire uh, the Romans in some cases, you know, like Tiberius Gracchus. In the end, it's all, it's all fun to listen to. So thanks for coming with me. Thanks for coming with me on this story about the Celtiberian Wars. I hope you enjoyed this little three-episode primer. Well, it's not really the primer. At least the, fir- the first three episodes, I suppose, of this season in which we're going to talk about the late Roman Republic. In the next episode, we're going to explore some of the fallout from these wars. And some of the things that happen to the characters that we've followed back in Rome. And it's going to be uh, bloody interesting. Let me put it that way. I hope you've enjoyed it. 
If you have, please like, follow, subscribe. Do all those wonderful things. Leave us a review. We would love you for it. And not in a creepy way. If you're feeling squirrely, you can go to my website. That's dwhawkins.com. Sign up for my mailing list and get yourself two free fantasy books. So I'll see you guys next time on Courage and Conflict.